Welcome back to our panel discussion, Jumpstarting IT Modernization in Government, sponsored by PEGA here on federalnewsradio.com and Federal News Radio 1500 AM. My guests today are Doug Averill, the Global Government Business Line Leader at PEGA. Eric Mill is Senior Advisor for Technology Transformation Service at the General Services Administration. And Joe Paiva is the Chief Information Officer at the U.S. International Trade Administration. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. And I want to get into this a topic that Joe mentioned very early on in the discussion, and that is the journey maps, the understanding of what it is that the user really needs and wants and has to have as we deploy applications. Very different model from the old coding legacy model. And uh, so Joe, since you mentioned it, we'll go to you first, and uh, ultimately that's really what drives what it is that you deploy. So how do you get there? Well, yeah, for, for us it's kind of a two-step process because the first is realizing that 99% of our end users are no longer people that work within the ITA. They're the actual small businesses out in the United States who want and use our services, As right? As we get into this digital services, digital, digital services delivery, world, right? Yeah. So you, you, so the first thing that has to happen is you have to actually train the 1% to be able to know how to act as a proxy for the 99, right? So there's, there's actually a training of staff in this new digital world, how to speak digital, if you will, because when it comes time to build the apps, so we use a completely agile environment where every two weeks is a two week sprint cycle. And the way we do that is we have business users who build user stories and they, you know, they go through this whole grooming process, but every two weeks when they start, they're taking those user stories and doing them. So in order to get to the point where the business can do that, you have to first have business users within the agency who know how to get together customer focus groups, know how to ask them the right questions, know how to figure out what our customers want because government is no longer about navel gazing and, and feeding the government beast. It's about feeding the public's needs, right? Which is where it should have always been. And so those people have to be trained to understand what the public needs and then they have to be trained to translate that into things that can be coded, you know, these, these user stories and process maps. And that, that is a lot of training of the business people and it's a dedication of business resources to reach out and have these focus groups and document the results of those groups and, and work side by side. These teams are no longer IT building the system. It's, it's a joint IT business team working together and every day that business person is watching this thing get built and looking at it and checking it against that user story. And so that's the, to me, that's the, the kind of the crux of it. Yeah, so Doug, do, do your customers tend to understand the fact that their customers have to be part of this whole continuum here. Yeah, that's one of the most fascinating things when I look across um, government. Um, it's really sort of where is that continuum. Most governments are in that, that point now where we really understand who the customer is. As Joe was saying, I mean, years ago it was writing 10,000 page requirements. Um, I actually saw a file cabinet of those the other day when I was traveling. Um, we've gotten away from that and really, um, I mean, I see governments working with us now um, embracing DevOps, sort of beyond Agile, mm -hmm. but let's get, let's get really quick. And I think a lot of that is driven by this general um, appreciation, understanding for um, frequent updates, frequent releases. And the, the analogy is sort of the thing I always talk about is how often do you get an app update on your phone? I mean, it's almost every day there's another app that's got an update. You may look at it, you may not. Next time you open it, there's new functionality. And that sort of mindset and that expectation is, is what is really, I think, firmly getting entrenched in government. So when it comes to sort of bringing in customers and understanding how to bring the requirements into an application, we move beyond big stacks of, well, what does the legislation say and what do the rules say and what do our lawyers say to, we know why we're here. And I see that all the time. As a former civil servant myself, very passionate about making sure that we're both following the, the law and the intent of the mission, but also serving the public. But now it's a question of how can I bring the public in? So we see in projects um, customers working together, picking up a system, and actually we've had Pega Systems applications that have been developed by one customer, zipped and emailed to another, and they're deployed and then implemented or configured on further. Um, 
and, and you're kind of getting all of that residual knowledge and that best practice along with it. And then we see people bringing in law enforcement officers. I've been into um, scrum rooms where there have been people in uniform because they're getting playbacks. I mean, how refreshing is that in government that we're involving everyone, not just, again, the lawyers and the policy makers, but the people who are actually going to hold the tablet in their hand or are going to use the system or answer the phone. Yeah, and Eric, so the people that come to the Technology Transformation Service, you would presume they have this in mind already, do they? And, and how do you make sure they get their heads around it? Well, so I, I, we find that uh, it is, people generally get this idea intellectually, that, and it's very hard to argue with, that you should probably interview users and get their feedback and incorporate it into the development process. Uh, I think where the rubber hits the road and where things get challenging is when it comes time to actually pay for that instead of paying for other things, right? And I don't, you know, partly, yes, like if they're working in a paid arrangement with us, it's, it's how that fits into the money they're paying. But I also mean internally, right? Like we have people who work full time for us whose job and expertise it is, is to do usability research, set up user interviews, synthesize that work into something that's actionable. Um, and so we employ those people, right? They're, they're actually part of our budget. Um, and that, that is actually what it takes. And I, I think in part when it comes down to making that, that kind of money decision, that kind of prioritization, there's a human factors component, right? Is the people who, are, who have the idea for the project and who are the product owner, like they kind of think they're right already <laughs> about what they want to build um, if you really start asking them to spend money. And I think getting past that has been, been a big thing. Um, we certainly do a lot of that work. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, even for our own products, right? If we're, we have a, a single sign-on platform that we're developing for citizen accounts, uh, a, a, including a very wide variety of, of citizens in different situations. So we go to libraries, right? And we actually go and see how people whose computer use is primarily in public libraries use the applications that we're building. We'll show people mm -hmm. prototypes. Um, we will do this work. And it is extremely valuable. And actually, I also think it's a little bit to get back to a point Joe made earlier about every mission thinking that they're kind of a special snowflake. You know, one of the most useful outcomes of this kind of usability research uh, can be to show demonstrably that actually the thing that you're trying to solve has been solved, at least most of the way, before. And you could probably be better served instead of developing a big new thing by going in that direction. Sure, Doug? Yeah, I would just add to that. I think that's spot on. But it's great to have that expertise up front. I mean, I absolutely see that as a best practice, as Eric was mentioning. But I think that I see, uh, one of the things I see as a success factor is a recognition that in any large um, project, whether you're installing a COTS, configuring a platform, working with modifiable off the shelf, you might miss a customer, you might miss a perspective. So you really need something that's flexible and you need to be able to then go back and iterate quickly because it's not sort of a one and done, it's a, um, we're gonna get our best minds together, we're gonna map out everything we know and then be ready to, to, to modify and configure as we go forward. Yeah, Joe, have you had some surprises in doing this research as to what the companies out there dealing with ITA need and want and hope to do uh, that maybe something that didn't occur to you as you look for their journeys? I'm not really qualified to answer that, right? Because it's, it's, it's more, really more the, the business people who know them. And I think, I don't think there's anything they've asked for that surprised everyone but there's a lot of things they ask for that surprise someone. Does that make any, does that, it, it make any sense? Because you have 3,000 people in the ITA, and they all, you know, to Eric's point, they all pretty much know what they think the customer needs, right? And they're all 90% right, usually. It's, it's the 10% that, that kind of throws people off, I think, most of the time. But and it could also be the 10% that people, that would cause the public, the member that you're serving, you know, the constituent to say, boy, they're, they're really sharp versus Forget about dealing with them. Well, that, and that's it. And you know, not to sound like a broken record, but it, it, it kind of all goes back to making the argument for this next generation of SaaS development environments. Because when you're talking about iterating quickly, if you're still writing Java code and compiling stuff and you know, then going through that process before you deploy it, um, there's nothing like you know, doing configuration in a SaaS pass platform um, and there's a bunch of them out there, right? This isn't just about any one vendor. We use four or five of them. There's nothing like being able to do that, show it to someone, they see it, they like it, and it's in production 30 seconds later. And that, and that when you can make those kind of changes on the fly, and when you have that platform and everybody's apps are built on the same platform, so they're seamlessly integrated in real time, that's a powerful, 
powerful place to be in terms of actually managing your customer base and your information. All right, so getting it right and getting it quickly and getting it deployed out there and using reusable components and using the low code, no code platforms. Uh, why then, and we can kind of finish up on this, is the number that, that is so intractable in government this, and that is the ratio between operations and maintenance high and development of new things low. Can these methodologies we've been discussing get us to that nirvana where that ratio flips? Is, I have to just, that is a ridiculous <laughs> ratio that someone came up with and thought it was <laughs> meaningful, and it means nothing. Those terms but mean it has been enshrouded. In it's policy, been though. enshrouded, but it's it's a stupid policy because it means nothing. So compare the compare the <laughs> investment versus operation and maintenance cost of Amazon to GE. They'll be very different. So what your business does, if you know, if I use nothing but SaaS out of the box, then my development costs quickly go towards zero. And everything is O and M. My annual subscription is O and M. So to say O and M is bad development and modernization is good is just a crazy a crazy oversimplification of a much more complex problem if someone wants to say how much money am i spending to support legacy government coded applications that don't deliver and aren't secure isn't that what i said versus how much <laughs> but no i i get irate about this because o and m because the way government accounting systems are set up that ratio, that, that everyone wants a 22 caliber answer for a 44 magnum problem, right? And it doesn't work that way. You can't just look at O&M and DME. You have to look at what you're actually spending money on. Are you spending on legacy? Or are you spending on good stuff? And that that is not an O&M app dev conversation. It, it's just the way the accounting works. I guess maybe 222 is would equal a 44 <laughs> with both well, hands. I'll take the 44, you take the 22, and we'll see who wins this fight, right? The, uh, all right, uh, Doug, your perspective. Yeah, I, I think it, at the end of the day, what we can all acknowledge is that you get sporadic and sometimes small amounts of really transformational um, appropriation. So when you get something, you need to make sure that you're not doing a, uh, a 10 year project that may or may not go someplace. What we're talking about is making sure that IT modernization is a journey and it's not a single buy. So when we've, everything we've talked about from DevOps to agility to automation to business process management to having a, a SaaS and PaaS and modifiable off the shelf platform, it all supports making sure that IT modernization continues so that when you do get money, whether it's 5%, 50%, whatever the ratio may be, that it becomes something that is truly transformational and moves you forward in the eyes of ITA, your customers, your internal stakeholders, whoever that may be. So it's when you get money, make sure that you're doing it in the space, that the, the place that's going to get you the, the most leverage. All right, Eric? Yeah, I think it goes back to the very first question that you asked in the first segment, right? At about, uh, and for me, that's agility, automation, and sharing, right? So if you, the, the, without comment on the specific metrics and ratios that people have looked at or published, like it is, it is non-controversial to me to, to look at how uh, a lot of federal IT operations run and see people saturated with manual maintenance work, um, and some of in, people, but people choose that. People often want that maintenance work. They want those touch points. They want to feel like they are overseeing things. They want to feel in control of the systems that are around them. And there, there is often an unwillingness to just, you know, have a script do that or have a, have, have uh, some serverless thing do it or, or farm that job out to Amazon or something like that. Um, and I think that's, that's what has to happen. And I would also say that you know, shared services is is a is a clear win, right? So if you if you are using shared services where, for example, different layers of patching are done for you, and you don't have to think about that, that is less maintenance. And if you're sharing code and software, and you're actually getting bug fixes from different agencies together, that is less work. That is less maintenance. All right, a lot to chew on. We're going to have to conclude our discussion now. For more on this discussion, to view the whole thing in its entirety, go to federalnewsradio.com. Use the search term PEGA. On behalf of PEGA, thank you for joining us. A link to the archive session will be sent to you shortly. If you requested a training certificate, you'll also receive an email with download instructions after the webinar. This concludes our discussion. Thank you.